Tuesday in July, or the, the second Tuesday in July, because it's the 4th of July holiday, but we're so glad that you all remember and that you could come today. The, uh, the opportunity to network with all of you is a, a great, great thing, and we appreciate you being here. My name is Brenda Payne. I'm the CEO here at the Hendersonville Area Chamber of Commerce. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you. I have a couple of special announcements this morning, some things that we don't routinely do. But the first thing I want to do, because we, you know, all of you are special guests, but we have a very, very special person in our midst today. And this person is not going to know that I'm going to do this, and I hope that, that she's okay with it. But we have a, um, a really wonderful friend who has joined us again today. Her name is Early Bradley. And Early uh, has been a volunteer and a member of this chamber for many, many years. And she just celebrated her 90th birthday. <laughs> Uh, where those supplies will be stuffed into those backpacks. And so for more information, 
information, please be in touch with Dana or anybody else on her staff at United Way 461-8371. And we're going to have these uh, flyers for you, so please pick one up on your way out. Stuff the Bus is a great, great opportunity for us as a business community to continue to support our school children, and we appreciate you doing that very much today. Thank you. All right, so my next order of business is to get luncheon started. And the first thing that we do is have our pledge of invitation. And I want to ask that each of you stand while we ask Frank to come forward so that we can uh, offer our invitation and pledge. Thank you. Please uh, join me in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for this uh, day that you've given us, the, just the beauty of the season and uh, this cool weather. And Lord, we thank you for the beauty of this community. We thank you for the beauty of this uh, people. And we just pray that you bless us and look after us, that you would uh, prosper us in everything that we do. And Lord, help us to do it in your name, uh, that you may receive glory and honor. And Father, we thank you for our meal. We just pray your blessings and encourage our bodies. And we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. Um, but Kara and Frank both do a lot of wonderful work um, in the community 
that both were recognized for their efforts. Um, also want to mention that Stephen Williams of Edward Jones was not, uh, recognized as the Young Professional of the Year. And for our Small Business of the Year, Christian Brothers Automotive One, which is Matt and Lee Bus, I think Matt's here today. Yes, a link here. Yes, he's here. So congratulations to them. And for the large business of the year, the winners were Liberty Park Rental, which is Ruby Bruce and Julie Hurst. And then last. Last but not least, um, the Ralph Buchanan Lifetime of Service Award was given to Mr. Mike Duset. Thank you all for voting. Um, the winners were, the, the, uh, those that were nominated came from the body of the chamber. The winners were you, the people, uh, companies that you voted on. So thank you again for your participation. It was a wonderful night. We had a lot of fun. Um, moving on, I want to recognize um, and just thank the new members that have joined or rejoined since our June luncheon. The companies that have rejoined or joined, uh, first we have Seven Seas Aquatics, which is Renee and Cisco, ATC Funds, which is John Gregory, Inspirity, which is Pierre Cambridge, Keller Williams, and Buchanan. National Interior Design, Christina Cabin. <coughs> Operation Group Aid, Mark Woods. Relay for Life, Dalton Bowman. Sign Club Company, Daryl Tungate. Subject TV, Trevor George. Summit Property Restoration of Nashville, LLC, Joseph Wright. TNHomesites.com, Stan Fields. And Way FM of Nashville, Ron Hill. Please give them all the welcome. Hey, Farrell. Ended up in Cumberland and 
essentially found their way to Neely's Bend in the United States. And that is how that institution ultimately began with a mission, ultimately in the early days, as an educational and health, and to begin an educational and health work in the South. It began as um, the Nashville Normal and Agricultural Institute in 1904. They bought the old Nelson Ferguson farm down on Neely's Bend, some 414 acres. And uh, it soon became known as Madison College. Anybody here old enough to even remember the days of Madison College ever heard of Madison College? There's a couple. Young upstairs out here remember Madison College, um, which is the precursor to Middle Tennessee School of Anesthesia. That institution actually closed in 1964. Then in 1907, it began another school. In 1907, the health work began there as Madison Sanitarium. Remember those days, which then became Madison Hospital, which ultimately became the Tennessee Christian Medical Center, where I happened to have worked for 26 years and was, was privileged to work there. But some of this very room helped me through you, Gilda, Danny Hawkins, and some others. Uh, the college in those early days emphasized a curriculum of agriculture, <coughs> teacher education, music, and general liberal arts, and certainly including four different healthcare disciplines, including nursing, radiology technology, laboratory technology, and nurse anesthesia. Nurse anesthesia. In 1950, <coughs> Madison Hospital School of Anesthesia uh, began. Uh, we had a principle of a place for students to come where they would not have Saturday or Saturday conferences for their study or their work. In 1964, it became known as Madison Hospital School of Anesthesia. In 82, it became a separate 501c3 and charter as the Middle Tennessee School of Education, 82, 83. And one of our charter trustees was sitting in this room in the back corner, Danny Hawkins. So Danny, we appreciate you helping us keep going. Back in 1990, MTSA became uh, regionally accredited by SACS, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. 1994 was approved to offer a master's of science degree, which we offer uh, to this day. So today, MTSA offers a master's of science degree with a focus in anesthesia to qualified RNs who wish to become certified registered nurse anesthetist. Not in, not in the anesthesiologist, nurse anesthesia, nurse anesthetist. It's a 28-month program. Uh, the board has approved that we ex we can accept up to 72 per year, one annual enrollment uh, per year. And the new class starts from July 23, uh, 64 students in the Lexington County and I'm aware of. So we're accepting this year up to uh, 64 uh, this year. The school does have a major economic impact as well. Uh, annual revenues are around $5.5 million. Uh, and some interesting statistics. The students this year who are class coming in, well over 50% of them are coming from out of state. You might not expect them to come from out of state here to the middle of the city. Average age of our students, roughly 30, or a tour, or a tour nurse, not a young new graduate. Most of them, not all, most of them are in the three to five years of nursing experience before they come to our program. That experience, uh, has to be in a high-level tertiary ICU setting, typically it's cardiac ICU, surgical ICU, neuro ICU, trauma ICU setting. ER doesn't count, OR doesn't count. They have to have that uh, very com complex cases of ICU settings uh, that are precursor to come to our program. The program's rigorous. Uh, I can tell you that. I'm not a CRNA. Uh, Chris is. I'll introduce him in a moment. But it is known for its, I'll call it work study uh, atmosphere, in that most programs across the country, there's some 108, 110 programs across the country. There are six in Tennessee. Uh, we're roughly the third, fourth largest program in the country. Most programs in the 20 range, again, we're up to 72 per year. Our, our students will rotate through most all Middle Tennessee hospitals, up to, even up to Bowling Green. Uh, we're very proud of the, of the system of the circumstance in that our students will receive more than double 
the numbers of surgery cases required uh, prior to graduation, and more than double the numbers of case hours required. 15 minute case, 45 minute case, hour case, and then the case itself. So the students come away very, very prepared. And I started to say earlier, our program differs from most in that most programs are front loaded didactic or book learning, back loaded learning. Ours is side by side. It's very unique. It's hard for the institution to manage and, and work. It's more difficult for the student as well. But at the end of the day, that student is learning in the classroom, ultimately what they're practicing in the classroom. Uh, it, it is rigorous, probably more so than most other programs because of that, how the dynamic, how it is set up. But the uh, proof is in the study. We have very excellent uh, outcomes with uh, passing the national certification exam. Our students do very, very well. Back to clinicals, we have a, an excellent relationship with Vanderbilt. Uh, key connection there. Uh, where today we probably have anywhere from 21, 2, 3, 25 students today uh, in clinicals uh, practicing there today. Exciting news. In September of this year, September the 3rd, I believe, will be the first day of our new doctoral program. Um, Doctor of Nursing Anesthesia Practice, DNAP. At the moment, it will remain a completion degree. In other words, you must have your master's in, in anesthesia, master's of science in focus anesthesia first, and then they can come to our program. Uh, it will be a hybrid online program, and you can imagine the accreditation hurdles, the level change, the university, the university status to make that happen. Those hurdles have been crossed and fully approved off of the doctoral program. And that's an exciting day for our institution and for the community at large. The board, as I mentioned, Danny is a charter member. We have three disciplines that make our board. That is, we have an equal contingent of MDs, medical doctors, CRNAs, person estimates, and then community folk, bankers, attorneys, uh, business owners. The chair currently is Dr. Steve Dickerson. I should say Senator Steve Dickerson, MD anesthesiologist, is our current board chair. We're proud of our faculty. There's been a lot of ramp up and embellishment of our faculty in that uh, most all, nearly all, have a doctorate now as they are required to have the terminal degree at which they teach. Uh, we've added several, and that's that's a, that's a wonderful thing too. Of course, faculty are the heart of any institution, and we're very proud of our faculty. <coughs> Facilities. Uh, some have been. We've hosted some member events out of the school, but um, very proud of what we have there, very blessed to have them. Uh, as really as a direct result of uh, friends and supporters like many in this room, uh, several foundations, including the local Memorial Foundation, what is a major, major grant, ACA Foundation, uh, CIC Foundation, uh, to name a few, uh, many healthcare professionals. Uh, we were able to raise $2.2 million, and we're actually looking at another potential campaign down the road as we anticipate uh, broadening our uh, learning resource, the library area, add an additional classroom, and then some free space, study space uh, there as well. Which I should mention on the table, there's some flyers regarding golf tournament. We're sitting at the golf course today. We're not talking about the golf tournament. Ours will be a September 19th. Uh, they're permanent. Uh, here at uh, I think uh, we need to have Mike Cook back in here to defend his title. He is first place, first flight. Last year's best tonight, but glad you were there. And we'd love to have you back. Um, I'll conclude, conclude my, my remarks with friend is Chris, just sharing our four core values. Um, there are this. We we are providing Christian Seventh-day Adventist values-driven curriculum. Now, if that said, not all of the students are at as far from it. Probably less than 10 percent are. We're open and Entrepreneurial and in any religious uh, faith. <coughs> Number two, academic and intellectual. The outcomes, I think, uh, speak volumes to the success of the institution. We provide a holistic approach to education and health care. We want to balance lots of the students. I mentioned as rigorous it is, but they get breaks throughout the year, and we want them to have a balance of life as they uh, enjoy their educational experience with us. And certainly, so finally, to prepare graduates to enter the workforce with confidence. If you've had surgery in this town, 
be it Hendersonville or Nashville. Uh, it's very likely, very likely. I've had somebody today tell me their son in law, I believe it was, had surgery, and one of our graduates of the anesthesia. 70% of all the nurse anesthetists in Middle Tennessee are our graduates. Huge <coughs> impact in the healthcare of this community in Middle Tennessee. A little over 50% of the state, or just under, excuse me, just under 50% of the state of Tennessee, 48, 49% of the state of Tennessee. Are our graduates. So uh, we're, we're, I'm blessed to be there, and I think the community is blessed to have MTSA uh, uh, putting on a nurse anesthetist institute. It's my privilege now to uh, introduce to you Dr. Chris Hewlin. Uh, Chris is our Dean Program Administrator. As you make sure you don't lose uh, Dr. Hewlin's academic achievements include the following degrees Doctor of Nursing Practice. Sanford, Master of Science with Focus in Anesthesia Management from our institution, MBA from Regis University, Master's of Science in Nursing from Vanderbilt, and Bachelor's in Nursing from Cumberland University, and Associate of Nursing from Southern Adventist University. He has a most varied and broad background, including teaching, nursing administration, hospital administration, <coughs> and academic administration. He is an active clinical practitioner, which, as a side note here, I should just add that every, and I think I'm accurate in saying this, every CRNA faculty and member of our staff are active clinical, uh, clinical practicing uh, CRNAs today. And I think that bodes well for our student body because not only do they teach it, they've been there, done that, and they're doing it currently. And I believe that's very important. He practices at the Center, uh, Center Regional uh, Medical Center Gallatin, National General Hospital, and uh, uh, other various clinical sites in the area. Prior to becoming our dean, he was the assistant program administrator uh, there at the school. So help me welcome uh, Dr. Chris Hewitt. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Lisa. I talk a little bit louder than everybody else. If you do have a hard time hearing me, yeah, and I also have a problem with ADD, so um, let me grab that mic and walk around. I apologize to the cameraman, I'll try to prevent doing that. But I'm a very interactive educator. Um, you've heard the, maybe you haven't heard the term, the sage on the stage. I can't stand that, that drives me crazy. Um, so I want some feedback, and if you have a question along the line, let's talk. Um, as I looked at topics, and I do apologize to those who've heard me, I've taken this show on the road a couple times. Apologize to the folks. The bad thing about um, talking about history, I, ethically I can't change it up a lot, this history. I could teach you 12 different ways to put somebody to sleep, but that's not the lecture today, it's history of anesthesia. So if you've heard it before, I apologize for that. Hopefully I'll think of some of the thread in there that I didn't hit you with last time. Um, but otherwise, we're just gonna take a, time, a little journey back in time um, whenever you look for a diverse group of intelligent folks like you, you got to kind of think of a topic that will engage you. And history is always a pretty good level playing field. We don't want to get into the pathophysiology of anesthetic drugs and the definitions of all that stuff. Because the, the thing about doing the clinical practice of anesthesia is I put people to sleep one at a time. Being a teacher, I do it by room at a time. <laughs> so I'm going to try to stay away from that today. Um, but we are going to talk about the practice of nurse anesthesia. I apologize to the folks if I scope, as I scoped out the room. I know the, the visuals are going to be tough on that side. I don't mind if you get up and move around or whatever. I'll probably end up over there in that corner of the room with you anyway. So move around if you want to. Um, beginning with anesthesia, believe it or not, this is a pretty new field. Um, you go back in time a couple hundred years ago, and we're going to talk about that time. There wasn't much. The way we started off in the world of anesthesia is we had this. A stick. I mean, it's like, oh, this is going to hurt. You know, get that bullet out. We've all seen the Western, buy the bullet, whatever. But literally, the, the whole perception of pain and how you dealt with pain early on and, and surgery, and that is a really new developing field. It's really exciting from that perspective. We're talking as early as 1842. Here's um, Cripper Long. Anybody from Georgia area here at the Cripper Long Hospital? You guys heard of, you know, what that's all about. Clifford Long, he, he was a, Robert Long, I'm sorry, he was a pretty genuine guy, evidently, because he really, he's the first person to ever do an anesthetic, but didn't tell anybody. 
he kind of kept it to himself, like, hey, that worked pretty well. <coughs> and it did talk about it. Some other people heard about it and started in the field, started developing a little bit. Well, here's his fellow Chorus Wells. Now, this guy, he was a dentist. Anybody know the history of dentistry? That's a dark and ugly history. You think nursing was bad back in the days of nursing. Um, dentistry was not a well thought of profession. It was kind of a, an ugly profession. And this old fellow Horace got into this profession. Like, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to be a dentist. Well, he was a pretty sensitive individual, too, because evidently he didn't like hurting people. He had some real emotional issues going on. And, and the, the pain of all the dentistry drove him crazy. He was really looking for other lines of work. You know, like, I got dentistry kind of nasty. Maybe I'll go be a physician. Sorry, physician, too. <laughs> um, but a lot of people would start off in those fields and they would move up. And um, what Horace ended up doing, back in this day, if you, if you know the old days of theater, it was really kind of a brothel. It was kind of a rough place. The theater people would go in the back room, huff on nitrous oxide, and then go out on the stage and perform and act a fool, and it was all fun. Everybody had a good time. Well, Horace was in the audience, and he's looking up on the stage and sees these people out there play, dancing and doing their thing on stage, and this lady banged her leg really good, started bleeding, but never missed a beat. Hmm, Horace is going, that's interesting. Obviously, that drug has some effect on her. So he's trying to start trying it on his patients. Like, oh, look, up on this, let me do a little bit of work. <laughs> See how that works out for you. Well, it actually worked out fairly well for the, for the most time, on part, so Horace is like, I'm going to show the world. So old Horace books a little theater room and gets calls a bunch of professors and uh, healthcare people together, physicians and surgeons of the time, and goes to do an extraction. Now here's the teaching moment with my students. You got to get people deep enough in anesthesia. So when you start doing stuff, the patient yelling, that doesn't look good. So you got to get them deep enough. Well, Horace, he's kind of nervous. This is the first time anybody's done this in front of everybody. He doesn't get the patient deep enough. He yanks the tooth, and the patient screams bloody murder. Poor Horace gets booed out of the amphitheater, everybody yelling humbug, and he kind of went off and lived a very interesting life. If we have time, ask me. I'll follow up at the end with how his life turned out. But that didn't work well at all for Horace, evidently. Well, this other fellow, he was a little bit more polished, a William T.G. Morton. He came from up there in Mass General area, and he had it all together. So he was going to go, well, that demonstration with Horace didn't work well. I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to do a different demonstration. I'm going to use ether, because it works a little better than nitrous. We get people a little more asleep with ether. We're progressing in the world of anesthesia a little. So he does an ether anesthetic at a Mass General Hospital, and it was successful. He actually removed the lesion, and you, if you've heard anybody here the Ether Dome at Mass General, if you go up there on campus um, at the hospital, there's a place called the Ether Dome, and that's where the first successful public anesthetic was given. William was a, a bit of a, um, I could say, that Northeastern aristocrat. If you ever heard the term, this is no humbug. That came from this belt. That's what he said as he was walking off the stage, kind of to dig at the poor little horse a little bit. But um, that his parting words, this is no humbug. And that's what that term comes from. In 1931, and then we're moving into 47, um, chloroform was starting to be used in the OB practice. Now, what they did back here for chloroform is they would give patients, have you ever heard of that? Ether and chloroform are both things you put, if you've seen the old movies, you knock people out, you put them out real quick, that's chloroform, doesn't work that quick, just the movies, but you get the effect. Um, that was used in OB, and what they would do is we'd be giving it to the women, and they would breathe on it until the hand fell away. They would keep breathing, they wouldn't go totally out, but it would give them pain relief from OB before the time of epidurals um, for labor. Well, again, we're putting all this, we're going to history talk. Let's put things back in the frame of reference. These are the Victorian days in the mid-1800s. Here's a, a known Bible verse. It can create some controversy when you talk about pain, but we're going to keep it in context here. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. It's from Genesis. So that was what everybody's like, it's supposed to hurt. It's right here in Genesis. Come on. <laughs> well, you know what? That was everybody thought that. Until Queen Victoria.
Victoria came up, I think it was her fourth son. She said, this is crazy. <laughs> in me the court. <laughs> so there's an uh, imagery of old Queen Victoria up and on a little chloroform. Um, Prince Leopold, he came out just fine. And that actually, because you think about the, the way that the royal family, the hierarchy, well, she did it. That actually opened up the whole field of practice to all common people because of that action. The world of OB pain relief, it really could be brought back to this moment with a big turning point. So I think a lot of women have something to be thankful for um, for Queen Elizabeth there. 1877, the first official nurse anesthetist came on the scene. The interesting thing of, uh, with anesthesia, nurse anesthesia, anesthesia in general, however you want to look at it, yeah. nurses did it before doctors did it as a profession. The, the interesting thing was if you were a surgeon, Back in this period of time, you want to learn surgery, and you didn't do dentistry like Horace Wells, but you had learned there were a lot of medical schools, so it was on the job training. So what they would do is, hey, you want to learn from me, the renowned surgeon, you put my patients to sleep, keep them asleep, and I'll show you what I'm doing up here. So this is what you had all the time when people were doing anesthesia. They were looking over the ether screen, they were paying attention to the patients, they were trying to learn surgery. So what a few... And nurses have been doing this on the side all along, too. So coming along with Sister Mary Bernard, kind of created a profession of it. The nurse anesthetist paid attention to the patient. It wasn't trying to learn surgery because they weren't trying to be surgeons. They were practicing their field of nurse anesthesia. And that was how really the field developed. Money followed it later. And then it came back around. Physicians started entering the practice. And I will say, I think we have grown tremendously because of that relationship. That partnership, which is kind of a weird anesthesia twist from a nurse's perspective. Go through another little bit of a timeline here. 1931, Agatha Hodgkins founded the National Association of Nurse Anesthetists, which is uh, still in operation today. In 1947, they allowed guys to join. I find that interesting as a male nurse. And, that's a whole other conversation we can get into, but it was um, years after the um, Nursing and Anesthesia Society. In 1950, Middle Tennessee School of Anesthesia was, um, began by Bernard Bowen. In 1952, the beginning of certification of anesthesia programs started. So we've been in existence longer than the accrediting body has. And today there's over 40,000 practicing CRNAs in the United States. Yeah, I give this talk a little bit to some people who are interested in the field too, so we're going to move through these slides pretty, slides pretty quickly. But essentially the job, um, what does it look like? As you can see, there's many things up there. As a nurse and ethicist, anesthesia provider, we really can, I, I sum it up with anything that in the OR that's not related to what that surgeon's working on, we're responsible for. So that's everything. That's throughput, that's vital signs, that blood loss, urine, everything. It's our responsibility. That's why there's a bunch of things on that line there. Here is our actual venue. This, you see, a fairly intimidating work environment. I don't know how many desks look like that with all the wires and everything, but the OR and anesthesia machine, a lot of moving parts. However, what we try to remember everybody, really looking at the focus of our organization and our faith base and our holistic approach, the patient, what are they worried about? Dying? Is it going to hurt? Am I going to wake up? Can I trust you? There are a lot of these things going into their mind, and we as anesthesia providers have, what, 30, 45 seconds, sometimes two minutes to really make that relationship work. So there's a lot of pressure on the provider as well to build that trust early um, when we take that very um, seriously. Because this is ultimately their view in the end. That's a scary place to be. We don't, I you know, really remind our students, this is the view of the people you're taking care of that are entrusted. There's multiple practice settings for nurse anesthesia, the um, urban, the rural, trauma, the bread and butter. You got Vanderbilt. I work down in Lawrenceburg, good old sleepy town. We did normal anesthesia. I'm not into all that crazy cracking heads and stuff. I want to call them, but that's how I like anesthesia. I want a relationship with my patients. You can get into the trauma center and have all that wild stuff all day long by working in a big city like Nashville. There's OB specialty, pediatric specialty, cardiac, and actually pain management. A lot of nurse anesthesia. Into. As you know, a lot of things going on with national health care um, trends. I'm making this a political debate, but obviously we can all, I think, agree that we need to do something to health care to make it more affordable. 
As those conversations come up, I encourage everybody to think about advanced practice nursing and um, CRNAs, nursing ethics and spends, their role. And actually within the government, they did a study on the future of nursing by the Institute of Medicine. And the Institute of Medicine, this goes back to Abraham Lincoln set up the Institute of Medicine. This is no little, we're going to put up this group here to support this political party thing. You hear a lot of these groups and institutes popping up. They're the kind of the real deal. Um, but they did a very in-depth study and looked at the future of nursing. And the number one recommendation they had to the government, nurses should practice to the full extent of education and training. No more, no less. Full extent of training, we all have scope of practices. Um, the legal system, lawyer, or the legislators, let's look at the current state practices and listen to the Institute of Medicine's recommendation. We don't want more to full extent, but allow us to practice the full extent. Nurses should um, achieve higher levels of education and training. We're working on that. Nurses should be full partners with physicians and other healthcare partners. Be at the table. We don't want to take anything over. Full partnership. And effective workforce planning and policy making requires better data collection, and you probably see this in every government report. We need better data collection, and we all know that. What did MTSA? We reflected a couple years ago, 60 years, what are we, where are we going? We listened to what the Institute of Medicine had to say, and we actually, Jim mentioned it, um, we're enrolling our first doctorate program this September. I'm very proud of the group. We have 12. Um, High level, two of them come from another school of anesthesia in California. Some people with some very good um, hospitals to come into Nashville and be a part of that initial class. That's really big for the profession and for um, MTSA in general. Take two minutes here and explain what's going on at the national level when you hear these the couple terms DNP and DNAP. These little, little um, initials for something that is a national trend of what nursing is trying to accomplish. The um, association, the colleges of nursing, set a goal statement by the 20th, year 2015 that all advanced practice nurses would have a terminal degree, a doctorate degree for entry to practice. That didn't really get a lot of wheels on it. They're not really taking that very far. So no state has picked that up as law. However, the Nurse Anesthesia Society has said, we're putting a line in the sand. You're 2025, you cannot be licensed. You cannot get a certificate to CRNA without a doctorate degree. So they're the first entity within the nursing world to put the line in the sand. The entire nursing, nurse practitioner, midwife, all that have agreed on a couple terms. Doctor of nursing practice to identify a clinical degree in nursing for that terminal degree. If you're like us, not part of a school of nursing, then it's doctor of nurse anesthesia practice. That's to clean up a lot of the alphabet soup where there was doctor in nurse science, some had PhDs with a clinical focus, and there were a bunch of different initials and titles for that clinical degree in nursing. It is being standardized across the country, and you look at Vanderbilt, I got my doctorate from Sanford University, you look at all the major universities throughout the country, their nursing departments are implementing that degree. So if you see these people around the hospital, you understand their role. They're doctors, they're not medical doctors, and they should not try to play themselves off as being such. It is an education degree, it's a terminal degree, it is not a medical degree. There is a difference there I think patients need to understand. Um, so have a John decide if an advanced practice nurse comes into you and calls himself doctor so-and-so all the time in a clinical setting. That is not what they should be doing. They are advanced practice nurses, and I think it's real clear to keep that distinction out of um, respect to our medical physician partners who go to medical school and, and that means something different than the hospital clinical world doctor means physician it's not an education title and that just so you guys understand those degrees those um, initials being thrown around dnp is a doctor degree it's a clinical degree and it is will be in the future the entry level for advanced practice nursing following suit of what pharmacy has done doctor entry to practice therapy physical therapy and chiropractors and optometrists years back. So that's kind of the state of affairs, that's a little bit of history, and it brings you up to current time with MTSA. And if there's any questions, if we have time for that, or thank you for your attention. Okay. 
couple questions on salary range, ec range economic impact for the local community, obviously, um, is a great question. Um, starting salary in Nashville is one teams. Um, you go into rural areas, that number gets pushes up, um, up higher than 180s, whatever, if you're taking call every other night and, and working crazy. But one team's uh, normal job was to call in Nashville. Um, the side effects are, the very side effects, the main thing was the people, uh, nausea is a big deal, a lot of that is uh, brought on by some just chemical makeup of the person. We got a lot of new anesthetic preventative issues for nausea um, that are out there. A lot of times the narcotic itself is causing that nausea, so we look for other ways to relieve pain. Uh, with that, to practice a regional anesthesia if you're being operated on your arm. Let's just numb up your arm so we're not giving pain medicine for your whole body when that's all we're working on, is really addressing some of that. And then pain, obviously. Post-op pain is a big issue and, and where a lot of the research within the profession is um, headed. And we put a lot of effort in that. And you know, acute pain services, you're going to start hearing about that. Um, at Bowling Green Hospital, we send our students up there for training. They're doing hysterectomies and outpatient procedures up there, if you can imagine that. People go home with two catheters in their belly and they don't feel their incision for three days. They pull the pain pumps out the third day post-op. They don't ever feel their incision. They're going directly to um, ibuprofen. So that's where the profession is going, where a lot of research and, and I just hired um, somebody to head that program up at MTSA to get that knowledge into the students' hands. So I can explain my memory loss on <laughs> There is a lot of studies that go into some of the long-term effects of anesthesia, and um, none of them are conclusive. There's a lot of debate, and that's a great, a great place, and you can do a lot of study there. But there, none of conclusive. You don't have a, you don't have an answer for that yet. Uh, how many schools are offering the doctor program at this point? Um, anesthesia schools specifically, I don't have an exact number. The doctor and nurse anesthesia practice. There are four others. Um, one starting up right now with us. Two of them, three of them have been out there. So four others, five total at this time that have been through the accrediting body for that. Um, the, what a lot of them are doing, Sanford University has an anesthesia program, but they have a DNP through the School of Nursing. So that's how a lot of them are doing it, is through their School of Nursing, so they don't have to take that on as a standalone group. Um, if ether and chloroform were widely used in the early days, what makes up the anesthesia today? What chemicals okay. are used? That's great. Um, good question. All of our anesthetic drugs, there's two classes. They're inhaled anesthetic, which those kind of were. We didn't drop inhaled anesthetic. But we have three major ones, isofluorine, sequelfluorine, and desfluorine. They are actually um, the fluorocarbonated component on the... Yeah, I see everybody glazing over. It's the, <laughs> it is the, when they tag the fluorocarbon onto the anesthetic and held part, got away a lot of weird side effects and gave us our modern um, drugs. <laughs> and then the, um, the IV part, good old propofol. You know, Michael Jackson made that one popular for us. I know we can practice up here about that. But what an incredible drug. Come quick on, quick off. It is wonderful for what it's supposed to be used for. With the right people around you, over seeing it, and you get it. But those are the two main classes. Good question. All right, thank you, everybody.
right at the end, so if you did put in your business card, you have just a couple minutes while I do the announcements. Just look one up here and get it in the bowl. But um, we have got a lot of things going on upcoming um, month, and I know that we've done the, the Freedom Festival announcement, so we want to make sure we see all of you at the park tomorrow. Um, fireworks at 9, so you don't want to miss it. Um, there's a lot of connection opportunities going on. You all are aware of these. It takes place every Wednesday at noon at our office. The um, next business after hours is actually on July 18th. First State Bank is going together with um, Latham's, the wedding event center on um, Saunders Ferry Road. So it's actually at Latham's, but First State Bank is the primary host. So if that gets confusing of where you're supposed to be, don't go to First State because you will be there all by yourself. Um, and that event will be from 5 to 7. We have a very special treat for you at the luncheon next month. Um, be sure to make your reservations as you always do, but we are going to take a special field trip. So we are done at the three hour tour, because by the time you check in here, we have graciously had Anchor Tours step up to provide some travel for us, and we're going to take everyone down to the Music City Center for a very special um, tour from Steve Tuck with Tuck Hinton Architects, who is actually the design firm of the center. Um, we will meet here, we'll grab lunch, and we'll give y'all the logistics and that kind of thing closer to time, because I know you won't remember over the next month. But basically, clear three hours off your calendar. Be here about 11.15, we'll check you in. Pick a buddy, because we don't want to leave anybody downtown. And unless you behave, just behave, and then we might just leave you on purpose. But <laughs> Um, Amanda has been working so hard the last month to get our directory together, and I'm going to need help with volunteers. So if you would like to assist in directory delivery and how that can be a great networking tool for you, see me afterwards and give me a business card, and I'll tell you how you can take advantage of that great opportunity. And I need about 50 people, so everybody in the room can volunteer, and I'll help it be disappointed. The Taste of Henderson deal. Cassie is going to have a new little addition in the family prior to this date, but on September 12th, we want you to mark your calendars as the um, Streets of Indian Lake will be the host location for that event again. We already have our tickets. We're still looking for food sponsors and vendor sponsors, so if you'd like to, um, probably have about 2,500 people there that night. If you'd like to get your business in front of that, see Cassie for details up until the baby and then see me. <laughs> Um, support opportunities, we are still having our um, orientation, lunch and learn, coffee, tea, what's in it for me, whatever we want to call them, but um, July 11th, we'll be at the chamber office from 11.30 to 1, Jets is going to feed you, and we want to um, take the first 25 that register, and it's a free event, so if you've not been to one of our orientations to learn all that there is to know about the chamber, we encourage you to attend, um, and 25 is about all I can get in the room, so just be sure you register, so and get your packets prepared. And then Brent is going to have a coffee and conversations here July 12th. Um, we're going to have the school board um, share the latest updates and that type of thing. We do meet in the classroom right here about 7.15, so it's early, but we do ask that you register so that we have enough um, coffee and continental breakfast prepared for you. So I think that covers it, but we're going to give away a few door prizes and my continuing link, so don't expect to win anything. <laughs> The first is a Jets Pizza giveaway, and Matthew Evans, who helps me in a main case today, so say hey to Matt, and I'll give these to you right at the end. Signature cleaner, Ed has done this for years, so thank him so much. That new certificate will go, Lee, this has just been your lucky month. We have another special giveaway for the Jets Pizza Thank <laughs> you. 